Carking University of Canada in Leavesden, Hertfordshire, Field Marshal and Lady Margaret Alexander arrive. Canada's future Governor General is guest of honor at the official opening of the second term of the college. Greeted by Lieutenant General Simmons, DSO, and by Brigadier Beeman, OBE, the college prexy, the field marshal makes a tour of inspection before addressing 572 soldier students who are enrolled for the forthcoming term. The Carter University also offers extension courses in which students gain practical experience working for various organizations in the United Kingdom. Typical of the service people who have availed themselves of this opportunity is Lieutenant Francis Hutton of the RCE from Hamilton, who studies British transportation systems in the Mitcham Yards of the Southern Railway. At England's Royal College of Nurses, nursing sister Mary Cohn from Brantford, Ontario, takes a course in nursing administration. It is a specialist course which gives her training in hospital management and in filling the role of superintendent. A veteran of North Africa and Italy, nursing sister Cohn is gaining knowledge which will magnify her stature in her chosen profession. At the Architectural Association School in London, Lieutenant Sandbrook of Montreal attends a refresher course in design. He has won a number of red seals for work handed into the association's competition for the design of buildings of tomorrow. Private Iana Cohn of Vancouver is taking an extension course in copper work at the J. Russell Company, noted London ship repairing firm. He attained skill at copper work with the RCASC, repairing radiators of three tonnes. Now he is gaining proficiency as a copper fitter and repairer. At the Ilford Radiographical School, Corporal Jolicoeur of the RCAMC is studying for a degree in the British Society of Radiographers. He is another of the many who will follow trades learned in the services. So continues the training of yesterday's fighting men for tomorrow's positions as wage-earning citizens. In years to come, hundreds of ambitious service people will owe their success to the Carkey University of Canada. In London's Trafalgar Square, affectionately known as Little Canada, crowds peer through the fog to see Nelson's column scaled by steeplejacks. Observers with field glasses have noticed marks on the Admiral's back which might have been caused by a bomb during the Blitz or by pigeons. Mr. William Larkin climbs the monument to get the real low down from very high up. 18-foot lengths of scaling ladder are fastened one on top of another, all the way up to the Trafalgar Hero's cocked hat. The last time the ascent was made was in 1919 to take down the decorations for the victory loan celebration. Then Mr. Larkin Sr. hit the high spot. Today his son, in lounge suit, no hat, and with a cigarette between his lips, scales the 201 feet to the top. Today, as in 1919, hundreds of Canadians on repat leave, waiting for the boat to take them home, watch the proceedings with interest. So history repeats itself under the stony gaze of the little admiral who also won victory for empire. In Montreal, officials of the War Assets Corporation and farmers' organizations presided a lucky draw. Surplus army vehicles are being released to farmers. Lots are drawn to see who will be the fortunate owners because the demand far exceeds the supply. At a vehicle park, several types of army lorries receive their full complement of 1098 stores before being turned over to their new owners. As each farmer accepts ownership of his vehicle, its new civilian number is pasted on the windshield and the old gas buggy is officially demobbed. No more will it have its innards probed by the inspecting officer as he makes his vehicle check. Now, instead of hauling ammunition, it carries the rations for a growing, peaceful nation. Even the pneumonia wagon is taken to the soil. In an auto op demonstration, it proves its versatility on the farm as it did in the field. So the grand old mechanized veterans doff the carty to turn the wheels of peacetime development. In the capital of the Dominion, General Dwight Eisenhower pays a friendly visit to his good neighbor. The Supreme Commander on the Western Front knows Canadians. He pays his respects to the Canuck veterans under his command in this war and to the memory of their fathers who fought in the last.
After receiving an honorary Doctor of Law degree at the University of Toronto, he addresses Canada. Each of us has an abiding faith that those 3,000 miles of common border measure as secure a boundary as the world has known, defended as it is by mutual friendship, mightier than guns, tanks, and airplanes, more powerful even than the atomic bomb. There's something new and different in Appen, Germany. The special duty platoon of the Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders have added a new chapter to Hoyle's Book of Games. They call it Broom Hockey. The idea is to swap the pigskin into the opposing goal without landing up at the MIR with a broken back. The catch to it is that you must wear issue boots, and if you've ever tried to run on slippery ice while sporting Quartermaster's number 11s, you know it's not easy. Just so you'll make your goal the hard way, feather pillows, horse blankets, or what have you, must not be slipped into the rear end of the true. The only people who can wear skates are the referee and the goalies. Even Sonia Henney would have trouble holding her end up in these CAOF ice capades. <laughs> to be a great star in broom hockey, first you must master the sweeping technique. This can be done on fatigues while cleaning up the barracks block. The control necessary to negotiating a frozen rink without skates can be practiced while staggering towards camp after a night at the local. From there on in, you're on your own and may the best team win. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canadian service women and civilians attend a special fashion show in the Nova Scotian Hotel. It displays the creations of Canada's growing clothes designing and manufacturing industry. Even precious nylons are displayed among the hundreds of items which go to make up the glamour department of Milady's wardrobe. Members of the CWAC see just what they'll be wearing when they take off the war dress and put on the war paint. Because of restrictions, Canadian couturiers have developed designs in the textile mills of produced materials which will stack up with the best from the Rue de la Paix. So the Dominion has emerged as an exciting fashion center with Canadian creations making their mark in the world of style. When Joan Canuck is demobbed after a job well done, she'll be able to equip herself with the last word and delectable duds, which are entirely made in Canada. At Shipshaw Dam in northern Quebec, huge symbol of Canada's wartime industrial development, a million and a half horsepower of electrical energy is generated for the manufacture of aluminum. Canada's aluminum played an important part in winning the war. Now many new and novel uses for the light metal are being developed for peacetime construction. To nearby Arvida, bauxite ore, the basis of aluminum, brought by ship from British Guiana, is dissolved and processed in huge tanks holding 200,000 gallons. After drying in rotary kilns, the aluminum is reduced in pots, heated by as much as 20,000 amperes of electricity drawn from the great Shipshaw power plant. For convenience, the molten metal is cast into 50-pound ingots on a continuous cast circle. These are shipped to a fabricating plant in Kingston, Ontario, where the pure aluminum is mixed with other metals to form special alloys. The metal then is poured into billets for extrusion or ingots for rolling into aluminum sheets in a massive mill. Created during the stress of war, the world's largest aluminum plant is now building prefabricated aluminum homes to help relieve the housing shortage in the Dominion, the UK, and in Europe. The factory-built houses are coming off the assembly line at the rate of 75 per month. The completed bungalow is 24 by 30 feet, contains two bedrooms, living room, kitchen, and bath. It is the last word in prefab home construction. Now, as the final story in the final issue of the Canadian Army Newsreel comes to a close, the entire staff wishes you all health, wealth, and happiness in Canada, our home. <laughs>